Uh, talk to us about Antarctic ice sheet surface melt and hydrology and implications for dynamics and breakup. Probably a lot of you know uh, Allison, a glaciologist. She knows all about ice, right? And she's with Ceres, okay? So she's part of, of course, our host institute here at NSIDC. Uh, and her research, she likes to uh, look at and quantify glacier and ice sheet and ice sheet melt and ice shelf melt, understand the dynamics of ice sheets, doing all kinds of things from remote sensing, field work, modeling, whatever have you. Right? She got her doctorate in glaciology and ice from the University of Cambridge. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Allison, who's going to tell us all about Antarctic ice. Take it away. Right, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Mark, and hello, everybody else. Thank you for joining. Thank you to Ms. Deer for organizing this. Um, I'd first like to thank uh, NSF, who are the main funders of this work, and I'd also like to thank all the collaborators who have been involved in the three studies that I'm going to be talking about today and anyone else who's helped along the way. In terms of questions, I'd probably prefer questions to um, uh, be held till the end, unless anyone's got a quick clarifying question, but I'm not going to be monitoring the chat, so someone's going to have to speak up and let me know about those, if that's okay. So, um, I'm first going to give a bit of an introduction that will cover the importance of ice shelves for the stability of the Antarctic ice sheet as a whole, and ways in which they can ultimately thin and break up in response to surface melt, and then initially focusing on George VI ice shelf on the, uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula, I'll first present some field and satellite based observations, which reveal insights into the role of surface melt water on ice shelf fracture and flexure. And then I'll present results of our most recent study, which combined satellite microwave data and a sophisticated snow model to quantify Antarctic wide surface melt water production over the last four decades. And finally, I'll talk about some uh, current and future research. So now some backgrounds. So the future contributions of uh, the Antarctic ice sheet to global sea level rise is generally very uncertain. And this is largely because the future stability of Antarctica's ice shelves in response to a warming climate is very uncertain. So what are ice shelves? Ice shelves are the floating extensions of uh, grounded glacier ice on land, but they're not sea ice, which is frozen ocean water. Ice shelves have been described as the safety band of Antarctica by this paper because they fringe about 75% of the continent and act to buttress, or in other words, hold back the upstream grounded ice from otherwise flow more rapidly into the ocean. And it's that upstream ice that contributes to sea level rise. So the majority of the area of all ice shelves around Antarctica currently have a buttressing effect, as shown by the orange and brown color on the ice shelves around this figure. There are only very limited areas that provide no buttressing effect, shown by these blue areas. So, some ice shelves already collapsed. So Larsen A, which is up here, collapsed in the 1980s. Larsen B here collapsed in 2002, which I will talk about a little bit more in a bit. Um, and I'm also going to talk about George the Sith ice shelf, this banana-shaped ice shelf on the peninsula um, a bit later on. So as this simple diagram shows, when glacier ice meets the ocean, it floats as it has a lower density than water. The ice shelf is pinned to the land at the grounding line down here and both surface and basal melting contributes to ice shelf thinning. Surface melting is due to warm air temperatures, increases in radiation, and often warm downslope winds called fern winds. And basal melting, which is due to increased ocean temperatures, is actually the dominant process through which ice shelves thin. However, it's the surface melt processes that I will focus on in this talk. So, as I mentioned on the last slide, both basal and surface melting contribute to ice shelf thinning. However, surface melting also has another important connection with potential ice shelf instability. In warm summers, meltwater is produced on the surface and stored in, in spaces in the fern, which is old snow and not yet um, compacted so much that it's become ice. This free freezing of meltwater causes fern saturation and fern air content depletion. The process eventually results in an impermeable ice shelf surface, enabling meltwater to pond on top of this, as we see on the right-hand side of this figure. Subsequently, these lakes may drain via meltwater-induced vertical fracturing, potentially down into the ocean below the ice shelf, 
a process we call we call hydrofracturing. So what is a hydrofracture? So for a fracture or crevasse in glacier ice without water, the tensile stress, which is shown by the black arrows here, helps to keep the fracture open, whereas the ice overburden pressure, shown in the red arrows, tries to close the fracture. But once the water is in the fracture, the additional hydrostatic pressure, which is shown by the blue arrows, arrows can force the fracture vertically down. And given sufficient water supply, the fracture may propagate vertically down all the way through the ice shelf to the ocean below. So this is the key process through which lakes on ice shelves can drain very rapidly, often in less than an hour. And I should say that the same phenomena has been observed on grounded ice in Greenland, but their water drainage from surface lakes goes down to the bed rather than the ocean water. So the biggest event that got us interested in the effect of surface lakes on ice shelf stability was the breakup of the Larsen B ice shelf, which made the front page of the New York Times in 2002, now over 20 years ago. Sorry to bore those of you who've seen this image a million times before, but just briefly, so these two satellite images are spaced five weeks apart. On the left, we see thousands of surface lakes within this blue dashed area. Uh, and then on the right, we see that that whole area within that blue dashed outline has broken up, and now we see a melange or mush of icebergs. In total, about the size of an area about the size of Rhode Island broke up. And this event led to the speed up of the upstream gla grounded glaciers feeding the ice shelf, which a variety of studies have observed and modeled. And those ice shelves would have contributed to sea level rise. So from observations of this event, it seems that surface melting and lake formation and drainage can be very dangerous for ice shelves. And although at this point it had already been hypothesized that lake drainage events occur by hydrofracture, for example, by many studies by Ted Scambos and others, it wasn't clear why or how all these lakes drained in such a short period of time on this ice shelf. And this was therefore the question that colleagues and I investigated by a series of modeling studies over the last decade, one of which I'll describe very briefly. So our research built on the idea of hydrofracture uh, by also considering how surface lakes can either act as a load when they're full or an anti-load when they drain. And because ice shelves floating on ocean water, the load of a lake can cause them to flex or bend. Is this, if this happens, a specific pattern of fractures can form around the lake, as shown in the top figure here. So we see a surface uh, ring fracture around the lake and basal radio, radial even fractures propagating out from under the lake, under the center of the lake. If enough water enters the fracture under the lake, it can propagate down into the ocean below via hydrofracture. And if a lake drains by hydrofracture, because the ice shelf has lost its load, it will hydrostatically rebound upwards. And a similar pattern of fractures may form, but they'll originate on the opposite sides of the ice shelf. So now the, radio, the ring fracture is under the ice shelf and the radial fractures are on the top, propagating out from the center. So we therefore considered whether if that, this fracture pattern that I just talked about were to insect, intersect other lakes, whether those lakes could be triggered to drain too. So for this example in the cartoon, the center lake has drained and it's caused a ring fracture here, which has intersected these other lakes. And the lakes that are now gray have drained by via hydrofracture through that ring fracture, whereas the blue lakes are still full of water. So based on this theory, we then modeled the collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf. In this particular model simulation, uh, the yellow lake, which is indicated by the starter lake label here, was triggered to drain, and the stress induced from that event caused fractures to open up beneath the dark blue lakes, which also drained nearby. And then those lakes then caused the lighter blue lakes to drain, and then the green lakes to drain, and so on. In total, there were 14 stages and 626 lakes drained in this particular example. But in reality, we'd expect that there'd be more than one starter lake draining at any one time, which is how a rapid and widespread ice shelf collapse event could occur. So based on the results of the study, we suggested that chain reaction style lake drainage may have caused the breakup of this ice shelf. But when we published this modeling study, which was back in 2013, there were no field observations of ice shelf flexure in response to surface lakes. Um, these were needed to constrain and evaluate models such as this. And this is what I'm gonna talk about next. So 
I'll talk about our NSF funded study focusing on surface meltwater, flexure and fracture on George the Sit ice shelf. Um, first, uh, I'll focus on the field observations from that study. So, George the Sit ice shelf uh, is in the southwest of the Antarctic Peninsula, and it's the second largest ice shelf on the peninsula after Larsen Sea. However, if collapse occurs, the sea level contributions from upstream and grounded ice will be greater than for other, any other ice shelf on the peninsula, as this ice shelf buttresses the most upstream grounded ice. And extensive surface smeltwater ponding has been observed on this ice shelf since the 1940s. However, its retreat so far has been relatively gradual because um, it has compressive flow with ice sandwiched between these two land masses. So ice is coming down uh, from this side of the ice shelf and buttressing up against Alexander Island here. We conducted field work out of um, the Fossil Bluff Research Station run by the British Antarctic Survey, which is a super basic hut with some bunks, but um, definitely more civilized than camping. Um, and we had three field seasons on George the Sit. The first was in November 2019, so in spring in Antarctica, just before melting starts. We spent a month on the ice shelf um, and installed a variety of instruments. The field techniques and instrumentation we used here builds on a much smaller base study, which we'd previously done in the McMurdo ice shelf uh, in 2017, which I don't have time to talk about today. So as I said, we went in November before the melt season, um, and this was because it would have been possible to travel around on snowmobiles once melting had started, because it would have been too wet. So we chose rough locations of instrument positions and satellite imagery, but then to choose precise locations, um, we wandered around. It was still very hard to do so, given ice shelves are so flat. It was really very hard to know where lakes were gonna form, particularly as they tend to move from season to season. So we in installed GNSS or GPS stations to measure ice shelf flexure. Here's an example of one here. You can see it's raised up on, or the battery box is raised up on stilts because we're expecting so much water to flood the ice shelf. Um, we also installed three weather stations to monitor local weather conditions that could be driving melt and also three time-lapse cameras, one of which you can see here mounted on this pole. So here's a map of our instrument locations on George the Sip in November 2019, after we deployed them, but before melting it started. You'll note that the GPS stations, which are these red dots, are in transects. Um, with one in the center of the lake, and then the other's about 500 meters apart going out for them from the lake. So for example, this site here, which is called the local site, we expected the most water ponding to happen around here, where hopefully you can see my cursor, um, and therefore we put the other GPS 500 meters apart. The idea being that we could then measure differential changes in vertical ice shelf elevation along these transects, which can ultimately be used to calculate ice shelf flexure. So we got back to Boulder after the field work and then looked at satellite images of the ice shelf. We we're excited to see this huge amount of surface melt. For example, in the Sentinel-2 image on January the 19th in 2020, um, which we actually now know is a day of record high meltwater extent, as I'll show a bit later on. Uh, this huge amount of melt water ponding was also confirmed by um, from photos we got from pilots flying over the ice shelf in January 2020. Um, we were obviously eager to then get back to the field to download our data in the following spring, but then we all know what happened in March 2020, COVID. So we unfortunately couldn't get back in the following spring, so we completely missed that season. We did get back after two years, but we'd actually lost a lot of data, particularly from the GPS stations, many of which had become flooded with meltwater. So you saw in that previous image, um, we'd raise the battery box up about a meter from the surface, but because it had been two melt seasons, some of these lakes ended up being three or four meters deep, and we just had meltwater in the battery boxes. Anyhow, we did get some data, um, and we got some imagery from time-lapse cameras. So, for instance, here is a time-lapse video produced from a photo taken at noon each day from late November to late February, you can see melting really, really kicks off in January and March, and it looks like the entire ice shelf is flooded. 
and you just saw that the pole that the camera was mounted on suddenly swang around because it was so loose in the meltwater in the ice in which it was mounted. Here you can see a weather station actually by the end it's is tipped over due to the huge amount of melting around it. Oh. Sorry, go back. Um, so this is just one photo from that video. 19th of January, again, this is the day we know that had maximum uh, surface melt extent. Um, and it's just really to show what a huge expanse of uh, meltwater um, appeared on this particular date and generally in January and February in this melt season. So I'll now show you some of the data from the instrumentation that did survive after unintentionally being abandoned for two years due to COVID. Um, I should say that none of our data was set up due to transmit over Iridium because our cargo load for the project was already enormous. We couldn't add extra batteries for um, an Iridium connection. So some of the most interesting data we found is from this site here, indicated by the red box called South Doline. Um, and then this is the zoom in of that red box. So what is a doe line? A doe line is a drained lake feature where a surface lake has drained previously, leaving an uplifted rim around a central depression. So based on satellite imagery, we think this particular doe line formed at least 25 years ago, and it formed near the ice shelf's eastern margin and then moved onto the ice sheet with ice flow. And we chose a doe line for instrument deployment because the location of the central lake within the center of the doe line is predictable due to the surrounding uplifted rim, whereas elsewhere on ice shelves, lake locations are really hard to know where they're going to form early in the season because ice shelves are so flat, much, much harder than studying lakes on the Greenland ice sheet, for example. And then the other reason is that the lake is self-contained, again, because of the uplifted rim around it, which means that meltwater from around the area cannot enter the dough line. And this is useful from a modeling perspective. So uh, at this site, we installed four GPS, as you can see with the red dots here, but actually only two functions or two collected data, or rather two we managed to retrieve data from after two years, which were GPS one in the center and GPS two on the rim. Here's a picture of GPS one in the center. And then we also had a, a time-lapse camera on the rim here with the green dot shown in this image here. So this is a photo I took walking into this doe line. I'm mainly showing this to um, emphasize how large of a vertical elevation difference there is between the doe line rim up here and the center down here. It's about 30 meters in total. And that's obviously was taken before melting started. And now I'm showing you four key photos from our sequence of time-lapse photos, which show the evolution of lakes forming in the doe line basin through the melt season. So you can just see the, the doe line basin in the distance here, it's kind of this oval shaped feature. So panel A was taken in the spring before the melt season, which is when we installed the instruments. You can mostly see dry fern in that photo. Panel B was taken just before the peak melt season on January the 9th. You can see the lake areas are now pretty large and there's kind of three main areas that are formed, three main lake areas. C was taken about uh, two weeks later when lake areas have decreased in size slightly. We also see an interesting moulin and crevasses on the ramp around the central basin. I'll come back to those. And by the 17th of March, which is now near the end of the melt season, the lakes have mostly frozen over or drained. So zooming into that moulin I mentioned, so we think this moulin, which is labelled here, uh, opened up um, around the 9th of January as based on the time-lapse imagery. It appears as though the lake reached its maximum aerial, aerial extent on that date. And we think this moulin acts kind of like an overflow in a bathtub. So it basically stops the lake from getting any deeper at, at that particular location in the dough line. We also observe crevasses or fractures in a ring fashion around the lake basin. You can see them in both image C and D. So in C, you can see them that circular around here. They're on the ramp around the lake basin. We don't think they actually contributed to the drainage event because they're above any of the water level. Um, but we do think they form due to loading from the central meltwater lake in the basin. And again, you can see the crevasse very faintly in image D too. So this is the type of fracture that we think played a key role in the chain reaction lake drainage mechanism that I thought talked about earlier. 
And we think that these are the first field observations of such ring fractures, though they have previously been observed in satellite imagery. So now I'll show you some vertical elevation data from our two GPS. Again, we installed two, we installed four stations, but only two had data on after two years. That's GPS one and two. So the figure in the top right here shows the vertical elevation change of GPS one, which is the center of the basin in red, and GPS two, which is the doline rim in blue. Over time in the 2019-2020 melt season, so from mid-December to end of March 2020. The black lines for each are the five-day moving means, and these indicate that the GPS in the Doline Basin is lowering relative to the GPS on the Doline Rim. So here the bottom right plot shows the elevation change between the basin and rim as a function of time. So in other words, this is the difference between the red and the blue time series shown in the figure above. So this basically shows that the center of the dough line is generally sinking through the melt season. In total, it sinks by about 60 centimeters. And this is in response to the loading of the meltwater lake in the center of the dough line. So now some horizontal motion data from the uh, GPS stations. The figure in the top right shows the horizontal trajectory, trajectories even of the dough line basin in red and the rim in blue. So the start of the time series is in the top right-hand corner, which is the 16th of December 2019, and the end of the time series is down here in the bottom left-hand corner on the 1st of April 2020. So initially, the two GPS are both traveling in the same direction, as you can see, but a curious event seems to occur on about January 25th, which is indicated by the black box. So here, the trajectory of the rim at GPS in blue starts to depart from the basin GPS and travels in a um, southwesterly direction. So the bottom in the bottom, the plot in the bottom right now shows the change in the horizontal distance between these two GPS. And the increase in the horizontal distance um, changes most rapidly for the four days after January 25th. So this period here, during this period, the two GPS separate by about 35 centimeters in just four days. And in total, we see um, the two GPS separating by about 70 centimeters over the 60 days until the end of March. So as I mentioned with reference to the time-lapse photography that I showed, we interpret this event as the initiation and or widening of a fracture or even multiple fractures. Um, for instance, these crevasses that we see in a ring light fraction around the lake. And it's likely these were triggered by stress perturbations associated with the meltwater loading in the lake basin. So very quick summary of this section. Um, we analyze vertical and horizontal position data from two GNSS stations and one time-lapse camera during this huge 2019-2020 melt season. We observed ice shell flexure with the dough line center sinking with respect to the dough line rim due to the meltwater loading in the dough line. We observed a moulin opening, which acted like an overflow in a bathtub. And we made the first in situ observations of ring fractures. And we have a currently have a paper in revision for the journal Glaciology. So watch this space. Um, so as I said earlier, we couldn't get out to our field sites on George VI immediately after this big melt season in 2019-2020 but we knew it was huge from looking at satellite imagery. So while stuck at home during COVID, we focused on a remote sensing study on this ice shelf. We uh, wanted to quantify volumes of surface meltwater from optical satellite imagery. We wanted to quantify the aerial extent of surface and near surface melt from satellite microwave data. And then finally, we aim to analyze the potential local climatic controls over the interannual variations in melt using weather station data. So there's a lot on this slide. I'm gonna whiz through it for the sake of time, but we first used optical satellite data from plans eight and Sentinel two to calculate areas, depths, and volumes of surface meltwater. To calculate areas, we used a threshold-based algorithm, which is based on the normalized difference water index. To calculate depths, we used an existing physically-based radiative transfer algorithm that's based on the variables listed on the slide here. But in summary, this algorithm calc water, 
calculates water depth based on how blue the lake looks. And at the bottom of the slide here, I've just shown an example of calculated lake depths uh, based on the Sentinel-2 image shown on the left. Um, so here, uh, the area within the red outline is North Georgia Sit, the location for which is shown down here in the bottom left on the map. The main image here is from Sentinel-2, again on January 19th, which, as I'll show in a moment, was the date on which maximum volumes of uh, surface meltwater were observed. The yellow star indicates the location of a weather station, which the study uses data from. Oh, and this yellow box indicates the location of the South Doe Line study site that I talked about in the last study. So when we applied our water depth and water area and depth algorithm uh, that I described just a moment ago, we calculated the water depths shown in this slide. So the color scale on the right shows water depth. The mean depth of detected water is less than one meter, but in some areas it's over three meters deep. For instance, these yellow areas over here. The total volume measured on this date is 0.62 kilometers cubed, which is equivalent to 250,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. And again, I'm showing this date because this was the date of maximum meltwater ponding for both that season and over seven years, um, which we know from looking at the time series of all surface meltwater volume data over the seven melt seasons. So here we have surface meltwater volume on the Y axis. And on the X axis, we have the date from November to the end of March. And then each melt season from 2013 to 2020 is plotted in a different color. You can see the largest volumes of meltwater ponding were observed in the 2019-2020 melt season shown by the red line. And in this melt season, the volume of uh, surface meltwater ponding peaked on January the 19th, the satellite for which I just showed you on the previous slide. And on this date, the volume of meltwater was over twice that measured on any day in the previous melt season. So 2017, 2018 was the next largest, but the other melt seasons were much lower. So in the study, as well as using optical satellite imagery, we also used satellite microwave data. This was partly because it meant we could go much further back in time to 1979. So uh, to do this, we calculated melt days which importantly are days when meltwater is present on the surface or in the near surface in a particular grid cell. However, a melt day does not mean that active melting is occurring and nor can a melt day be used to gauge the melt intensity or quantity. That's the most important point. I don't have time to go into the rest of the other details here, but briefly we used passive microwave data from SMMR, SSMI, which are available almost continuously from 1979, but have a relatively low spatial resolution of 25 kilometers. We also used active microwave scatterometer data from ASCAT. These data are much higher spatial resolution of about four kilometers, but are only available from 2007. And our output was the total melt days for each melt season, which is from November 1st to March 31st. So, here I'm showing maps of active microwave derived cumulative melt days over North Georgia Sith from November 1st to March 31st. The top plot shows the climatology, or in other words, the mean number of melt days each year from 2007 to 2020. The middle shows the cumulative melt days for 2019 2020 only. And the bottom shows the anomaly of the 2019 2020 melt season. And these are obviously all for North Georgia set. There's that red outline that you saw previously in the Sentinel-2 image. So the spatially averaged mean melt days in 2019-2020 was 117, which is 48 days higher than the mean of 69 days. And now this bar plot on the right shows the cumulative melt days for melt seasons from 1979 1980 uh, to 2019-2020 on the x-axis. For both uh, passive microwave data, which are the blue bars, and the active microwave data, which are the red bars. And according to both data sets, you can see the highest number of cumulative melt days occurred in the 2019-2020 melt season. And generally, the two data sets are consistent, but the active data, which is red, is higher in most years. 
This is expected as the active microwave data is likely to be more sensitive to melt at greater depths in the snowpack than the passive data. So finally, in the study, we uh, quickly asked the question of why was there such a big melt year on this particular ice shelf? Because it wasn't on other ice shelves on the peninsula. Um, we're lucky that George VI has a weather station on its northwest margin where the yellow star is run by the British Antarctic Survey um, and pictures here in this photo. We, of course, had our own weather stations, three of them, but we hadn't managed to get back to the ice shelf yet to download the data. So we analysed the uh, Bass weather data to determine the local climate controls on the melt event. We first analysed daily mean air temperatures from 1979 to 2020. So the mean air temperature over this 40-year period is shown by the black line. And the 2019-2020 daily mean temperatures are shown as either positive or negative anomalies from the 1979 to 2020 mean. So positive are red, negative anomalies are blue. So we can see there are lots of periods when the air temperature is continuously above zero degrees Celsius. Uh, for example, this time here in February and March, these times are important because minimal refreezing of surface meltwater will have occurred during these periods. And incidentally, this area of blue here is when we were doing field work this season when the temperature did not really get above minus 10 Celsius. So that was fun. Uh, then to interrogate the local weather data in more detail, we then used 10 minute data instead of daily data. These um, higher temporal resolution data are only available since 2007 though. So this is a super complicated plot. Let's just look at a few things. So the red line shows the percentage of each melt season when the air temperature was above zero degrees Celsius. So in 2019-2020 season, the, uh, the temperature was above zero degrees Celsius for at least 33% of the season, which is the highest in the time series since 2008. And then looking at the cyan line, so this shows the longest number of consecutive hours when the air temperature is above zero. The longest period in this melt season was 90 hours, uh, which occurred in February 2020. And again, it's the highest out of all years since 2008, which is up here. So again, these periods of sustained warm air temperatures are important because these will be times when there'll be minimal meltwater refreezing occurring during each diurnal cycle, which likely enhances the surface melt albedo feed it back because water has a much lower albedo than ice or snow. So this would have led to more and more melt. And our analysis of winds, which I don't have time to show, suggests that these sustained warm temperatures reduce the advection of warm air mass masses from the northeast. Um, we only see very minimal evidence of warming due to fern winds. And in fact, as this dark blue line shows, we only calculated nine hours of fern winds total in this huge melt season. So very quick summary of that section. Uh, the passive and active microwave data both show surface melt duration and extent on North Georgia Sith in 2019 2020 were exceptional compared to the 31 previous summers. And the optical satellite imagery also shows that this melt season had the largest volumes of water since 2013. And we suggest that this record melt event was driven by sustained air temperatures of up to 90 hours, sustained warm air temperatures, I should say. And for anyone who would like to learn more, we have a paper published in the Cryosphere about this in 2022, 2021 even. Okay, the third of three studies. Um, I might need to move a bit quicker. So um, this study focuses on quantifying Antarctic-wide ice shelf melt over the last 40 years. As you might guess from the title, this builds on the study I've just presented for North George the Sith, but now we focus on all ice shelves and we also use a fern model, which enables us to actually calculate the meltwater production. So this is important because understanding the current and predicting future Antarctic wide ice shelf vulnerability to surface meltwater requires a detailed historical record of meltwater production. And as we've just seen, satellite microwave data can help identify the presence 
of surface melt and near surface melt, but not the quantity of melt. And climate models with fern representations can quantify melt volume, but snow wetness and density data for validation is sparse. Therefore, in this study, we address these limitations by combining passive and active microwave data with output from the fern model snowpack, which is driven by the global climate reanalysis model MERA2. We first evaluate modeled melt days against those derived from microwave data, because that's the best we can do given lack of in situ data. And once we've gained confidence in the model, we then use snowpack to quantify meltwater production from 1980 uh, over all Antarctic ice shelves. So you, you saw this slide earlier, I'm not gonna go through it again, other than just to remind you that a melt day is a day when meltwater is detected to be present in a particular grid cell on a particular day. These melt day data cannot be used to quantify melt intensity or volume, which is why in this study we use snowpack, the fern model. So snowpack is a detailed physics-based multi-layer fern model. It has a detailed energy balance scheme. It's been extensively applied and validated in polar regions, and it is forced with the global climate reanalysis model MERA2. And it's run at 836 points, which are distributed across the ice shelves. And as I just mentioned, we first calculate cumulative melt days from snowpack um, to compare with the melt days derived from the microwave data. And then we use the snowpack model to calculate meltwater production. So we first evaluated the model of snowpack by again comparing model melt days to those derived from microwave data. On the left is a map showing ice shelves divided up into eight regions. And those region colors correspond to the colors of the points in the scatter plot on the right. So this scatter plot shows the passive microwave derived melt days on the x-axis against the total annual snowpack model melt days on the y-axis, each melt season from 1980 to 2021. So there's one point for each of the 836 points. Uh, the regression line is the solid black line, and the one-to-one -one line is shown by the black dash line. So um, in general, we see that the height, the melt is highest on the peninsula, as we would expect. These are the purple dots up here. In general, the correlation between the modeled and observed melt day data looks pretty good, with a low RMSC of 8.2 melt days and an R squared of 0.75. However, in general, we do see that melt days simulated by snowpack are slightly lower than those observed by the passive microwave data, and um, as indicated by the slightly negative bias of minus 0.14. And this is likely because the relatively coarse grid of MERA2 fails to cap capture the localized atmospheric processes that are often present over ice shelves, for example, fern winds and catabatic winds. And these events often occur over the peninsula, which is the area where we generally see most melt. Now this figure shows time series of modeled versus, versus observed melt days, each melt season, again, over the last 40 years. So note the differing uh, y-axis, which show cumulative melt days. And uh, on the top left figure shows the mean of all regions, then the other um, subplots are for each of the seven regions. The blue line is observed melt days from passive microwave data. The red is the active microwave data, and the green line is the model melt days from snowpack. Um, so speaking very generally, it's notable that although the precise number of observed and modeled melt days differs slightly between the data sets in each region, the patterns of the interannual variability are relatively consistent between both sensors and snowpack. And this suggests that the interannual variability in climatic conditions are, is well represented in MERA2, which is important because it's MERA2 that's used to drive snowpack. So this analysis between the modeled and observed melt days that I've shown here and on the previous slide uh, give us confidence in snowpack's ability to also simulate realistic temporal and spatial variations in volumes. So we went on to do that. So uh, here is uh, a plot of meltwater production in gigatons per year, which has been calculated by interpolating the melt simulated at those 836 points over all ice shelves. 
The black dashed line shows that there's been a general decrease in meltwater production over Antarctic ice shelves over the 41 years of 0.55 gigatons a year, which is statistically significant at P less than 0.05. However, I also analyzed the melt products from MAR and RACMO, and although they also show decreasing trends in meltwater volume over all ice shelves, those trends are not uh, significant. We quickly had a look at the mean summer air temperature over ice shelves from Mera 2 over the same time period. And we found that this also decreased, though uh, it's only significant at P less than uh, 0.1. So that trend is shown by the red dashed line on this graph. Finally, it's interesting that we found a strong non-linear relationship between uh, melt days shown on the X axis there and meltwater volume shown on the y-axis. And this indicates that the melt day data from microwave data alone is not a direct indicator of melt volumes at all. And this is because the melting point, so zero degrees Celsius, is passed much more frequently in warmer summers. It's also due to the positive temperature albedo feedback. So as soon as you get some melt, you're likely to get much more melt due to the lower albedo of water. And this is also because once you've got large volumes of meltwater, they take much longer to refreeze than smaller volumes of meltwater. And all these reasons um, provide strong support for why sophisticated energy balance models like snowpack are required. Um, and finally, a quick summary of this section. So we use satellite, microwave, and fern model data to evaluate modeled melt days against observed melt days. Um, and then we modeled meltwater volume over all ice shelves from 1980 to 2021. Snowpack's performance in calculating melt days shows good agreement with microwave observations. And this gave us confidence that Snowpack was doing a relatively good, good job. So we modeled annual melt days and meltwater production decrease and found a small but significant decrease in both the melt days and the volume uh, over the last 40 years. However, this trend was not significant according to the RACMO and MAR data. However, of course, projected atmospheric warming means that ice shelf surface melt are expected to increase non-linearly in the future. So what we see in the past, there's no indication of what will happen in the future. Uh, and finally, as I just showed, the relationship between melt days and meltwater volume is strongly non-linear, indicating that melt days are really not a good indicator of melt volumes. So they should really just be taken with a pinch of salt. And uh, if you want to know more, we have a paper in GRL published in late 2023. So just for the last five minutes, I just wanted to mention, uh, very briefly mention three other projects, which in their very early stages and also focus on ice shelves. Um, so first, I'm interested in knowing which ice shelves will experience increased bonding versus large rivers. So the example ice shelf on the left here has a relatively flat surface topography, meaning that lakes can more easily pond on the surface and may drain via hydrofracture. So this is the situation that may lead to instability, as we saw in the case of Larson B. The example ice shelf on the right has a much steeper slope which has enabled a large stream and river system to fall, ending in a waterfall into the ocean, which exports water more efficiently into the, from the ice shelf and into the ocean. So this setup may mitigate against potential instability. As an example of an ice shelf with a large river system, here's a photo of the, of the Nansen ice shelf in East Antarctica. You can see a huge river here with a gigantic waterfall into the ocean. And then an additional complication of the surface of this surface river end member is the potential formation of an ice shelf estuary. So an ice shelf estuary is thought to form when a river actually on an ice shelf incises right down to sea level, enabling seawater to flow onto the ice shelf. The first of its type has been observed on Peterman ice shelf in northern Greenland. Um, for example, there's an image here from the paper by Alex Bacosian and others. <clears throat> In this photo, you can see floating blocks of ice in the river on the ice shelf. But we're not yet sure whether this scenario is likely to make an ice shelf more unstable. 
uh, but we ha currently have an NSF funded project to try and find out. <clears throat> and for a current NSF funded project, we're working towards incorporating the surface meltwater induced flexure and fracture processes, as I've talked about today, and as is shown in this flow chart on the right, into continental scale ice sheet models that are used to predict global sea level rise. So this is super important because there's currently no ice sheet model that can that can represent these processes in a realistic way, but they're obviously very important when it comes to ice shelf breakup and the subsequent acceleration of the upstream glaciers. So in our case, we'll be working with the ISSM model. And finally, um, we're developing some new instrumentation and data analysis techniques that use GNSS reflections from glaciated surfaces to detect changes in surface type. For instance, fresh snow, fern, ice, and or meltwater. And I've just returned from doing a proof of concept um, fieldwork study on the McMurdo ice shelf. If proven to be a success, this technique should be, could be super useful for ground truthing at satellite observations of surface melt. And that is the end. Thank you so much for listening. And if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear.